The Mint Door Podcast with Dr. Karen Tindall and Dr. Laura Schwint. Are you a high achiever feeling the burnout blues? Well, the Mint Door Podcast is your oasis. But before we introduce you to today's phenomenal guests, we're extending an invitation to something extraordinary. We're mixing up the perfect antidote to burnout with our Mint Julep newsletter, a weekly dose of inspiration delivered straight to your inbox. Each edition of the Mint Julep is more than just words on a page. It delivers connection, brimming with inspiration, positivity, and a dash of fun. Think of it as your virtual happy hour with a supportive community of high achievers. We'll help you unwind, recharge, and rediscover the joy in every day. So subscribe to the Mint Julep and let's clink glasses or coffee mugs to live a more inspired, joyful life one week at a time. And maybe you're more of a visual learner. Well, we've got you covered. All of our podcasts plus bite-sized coaching tips are on our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at the mint door. Subscribe for happiness on the go. So welcome back to our podcast. Today, we're thrilled to have the esteemed Dr. Sally Safa join us. Dr. Safa is a renowned periodontist, a passionate educator, and a thought leader in the field of emotional intelligence. As a board certified periodontist practicing in Toronto and an alumna of the University of Toronto, Dr. Safa brings a wealth of clinical experience and academic expertise to our conversation. She's also a dedicated educator, sharing her knowledge as a faculty member at the University of Toronto's Faculty on Dentistry. Beyond her clinical work, Dr. Safa is a sought after speaker nationally and internationally, specializing in mindfulness based stress reduction and leadership training. Her expertise in emotional intelligence makes her a valuable resource for professionals seeking to enhance their personal and professional lives. So get ready to be inspired and enlightened as we delve into the world of emotional intelligence with Dr. Sally Safa. Well, hey, Mint Door Podcast listeners, welcome back to another edition of our podcast where we are honored to bring to you our guest today, Dr. Sally Safa. Dr. Safa, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Uh, Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so happy to connect with you again. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, in your introduction, we referenced how emotional intelligence is a subject that you're really passionate about. And connecting that to dentists, we're always looking for ways to enhance our clinical skills, improve patient relationships amongst, you know, other ways of trying to take CE and do things. But how can dentists leverage emotional intelligence when looking to enhance those other aspects of their professional lives? Yeah. So that's a good question. I think the first step is realizing that we need it. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I think awareness that this is an important thing is the first step. Um, many people don't actually realize that they're going through their days with the on button jammed. They, They just have no awareness of it. It's, it's that lack of awareness that becomes the biggest hindrance to even people taking CE or listening to a podcast or engaging in this work of, of improving their emotional intelligence because they actually don't even know that it's something we need. Mm -hmm. So many people, when they hear it for the first time or when I talk, it's like it's the first time they've ever heard this information. Meanwhile, it's something that that we know from birth, like it's, it's, we're, we're herds, we live in communities, we learn from each other, we we're affected by each other, we work in a people uh, profession where we're in contact with people all the time. And we can't forget that, that our stuff influences other people, their stuff influences us. It's, it's just how we, how we are as herds. So this idea of emotional intelligence, I just don't think it's on people, people's radars. Mm -hmm. And And the idea that one could be triggered, the word, at work, or if one could be um, being reactionary versus, you know, responsive at work, those terms just don't, 
aren't um, on their radar. It wasn't, certainly it wasn't on my radar and that's mm -hmm. how I ended up getting myself in trouble, but you know, not clinical trouble. Like <laughs> I know that sounds like, oh, I got so much trouble, but trouble with myself. Like that's how I got myself in, in, in sort of a, uh, a state that then I, I realized, oh my God, I really have to do something. That's the first time it came into my awareness. And I hope that things like this will help people bring it into their awareness before, you know, it's kind of something they have to do. Yeah. yeah. What, what was that awareness for you? Cause that intrigues me that what was it that flicked the switch in your brain? It's like, there's something that I need to address. Oh yeah. It's a, it's it's really a horrible thing. Like when I, I I smile now when I tell this story, but it was it was the turning point. So I had been going. Uh, I'm working as a periodontist in a practice that I built from scratch. I'm busy. Um, I've I've gotten this reputation in my community. This is about. 12 to 15 years ago that that I'm sort of the female touch dentist who can manage really difficult anxious patients without sedation. I was part of that, I'm sure, you know, because I, I wasn't IV trained or I was, but I didn't like practicing with IV sedation. And people would come to me, but they'd be referred to me highly anxious. And I kind of prided myself in that I could get, get, get through this appointment with just keeping them calm with my sense of, you know, what I thought was being grounded or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And and I had a really anxious patient in my chair this particular day. And it was a gentleman and, and I knew he was anxious. Like I knew from the consult that he was anxious. Um, he wasn't making eye contact with me. He was like, he was shaking a little bit in the chair and I, all these should have been in my awareness, but it wasn't. And I booked him for this surgery without sedation. Um, and it's, and I'm doing a soft tissue graft. So it's a two site surgery. So midway, then the patient goes back even farther. I got to go to the palate, get the tissue. And there's this little thing called the greater palatine artery. And you don't want to nick that, but if you do, because everyone's anatomy is different, what do you do? You suture the darn thing, right? And so you got to put nice deep sutures and you suture that right away. So um, I'm going along, taking the graph from the palate the whole time this patient is white knuckled in the chair. And, and I have no awareness of how I'm feeling, for sure. I know I have no awareness because that wasn't even on my radar. And, um, or the effect it's his anxiety is having on me. So I nick very tiny part of this artery. This thing starts to bleed like a bleeder. Like I can't swear, but it's like pooling in his mouth. And in that moment, you have to suture the palate right away. That's 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 the only next step, right? Pressure, then suture. So this happens. He gets blood all in his mouth. He starts panicking. He spits. He sees this blood. He's triggered. And I'm trying to calm him down. I need to put pressure. So I'm like telling him, like, please calm down. I need to da 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 da. And I can't suture my hands are shaking so bad. I can't suture. So I thought I was having a heart attack. Like I actually thought I was like either having a stroke or I, I thought something physical was happening. Well, something physical was happening to me, but I thought it was something to do with some, some health related thing. So I told my assistant to put her fingers on the roof of his mouth. I was like, don't move your finger. I, I let me just step out of here and figure out what's happening. I literally fall to the ground. I was like, shaking. I was hyperventilating. My heart rate was up and I was so unwell and had to call on a colleague um, and who was not in the practice. So they had to come to my practice because I was so shaking so bad. Finally, I calmed down. I went back in, I sutured the palate and I came home that night and I was like, something is wrong. Like something is wrong. There were so many things that led up to that. But that was the turning point that I was, that I felt really sorry for myself. I said, I can't mm -hmm. do this. Twice. Like, this is actually torture, you know, and it's unhealthy. And there were so many things that were wrong about that scenario for me that, you know, I just thought I, I got, something's got to change. So that was sort of the moment. And some people have the moments and then some people don't, but that was mine. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, I mean, I felt every emotion, I think mm -hmm. on that journey, as you told that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
it's hard not to because we relate to each other right like you know we've we've been in these scenarios and 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 when i when i say this story you have no idea how many people come and talk to me after mm -hmm. like about endo like i hate molar endo i keep doing it i'm so anxious but i have to do it i'm the only one or I, i'm in a rural community or people send me molar endos or the principal dentist hired me because i said i could do molar endo so what now i have to tell the principal dentist i don't do molar endo like all sorts of stories that I think my story gives people the freedom to understand that they have choice and, and, and that, and, and the sort of now 10 years after seven to 10 years after this incident, what, what I, what I tell people is if, if I hadn't changed the way I practice, if I'd continued to do those things, um, I probably wouldn't last in the profession at all. And it was really difficult because how are you a periodontist who then doesn't do soft tissue grafts? Like that's like, that's half my job is grafting. Like, how can I say I don't do them? So I do them. I do them. Mm -hmm. I've changed my techniques a little bit. I, I now am very, the first step is I am so in tune with who my patient is and I am not I know that their anxiety will trigger my anxiety. I know that if they get triggered, I might get triggered. So I'm now very open to, have, there's an anesthesiologist that comes to our office and I tell patients, you're best served if you consider some sedation, you know, and, and we, we have an honest discussion, you know, for some people it's, it's a money thing. They can't because it's a monetary thing for some people. It's, it's lack of awareness of what's possible in a dental practice, but I give myself the option to say no. And to say that I might not be the best person for this, you know, and people understand like when you are human, I find patients understand and I don't take on uh, sinus lifts anymore. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, I wish I was doing them. Uh, yeah, I wish they didn't make me anxious. I really do wish. There's there's a cost to anxiety. And this is one of them. So I don't. Yeah. I, I'm good at them. I did tons of them for the first few years of my practice. But I just choose not to do them because I won't sleep the night before. And during the whole day and the procedure, I'll be, I'll literally lose half my life. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, thank you for being real and and authentic with us about talking about this, because I think that that, too, is something that is really hard in our profession of perfectionists and, um, you know, needing to put on this persona that we do know what we're doing all the time and we do it well all the time. Mm -hmm. And so just by hearing that story and knowing that everybody has those moments that you're not alone is yeah. super powerful. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and I'm curious because, um, first of all, if you could just explain a little bit about what emotional intelligence is, because I know when the first time I heard it, I was like, what, what is that? And, and then tell, walk us through what happened after that day. What did, what did you do then? What was your journey? in those, yeah. those first few, you know, months, weeks after that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's probably different, there, there are different definitions of emotional intelligence, my, uh, understanding of emotional intelligence, and we can, you can approach it from the mindfulness world, from the business world, because it, it's, it's a, it's a hot topic in the business world. Right. So for me, it's an understanding of who I am, and the effects that my emotions have on others and the effects that the emotions of others has on me. So that's emotional intelligence for me. It's what does what does my nervous system, my my whole sense of communication, my presence, my energy, what does that do to others? What what you know, do I understand my own system and do I understand the effect that my system has on others and vice versa? And this is this is in dental practice, this is with kids, this is with, you know, and and this this journey also helped me become a better parent, um, a better partner, uh, because I didn't realize how much my, call it zingy, you know, energy was having on the people around me. And when you move quick, and when you speak fast, and when you have this kind of 
sympathetic nervous system overdrive, then the people around you also think something's wrong. And, and this was bleeding into all aspects of my life. So um, it, it was, it was a real eye opener because after this incident, um, I, um, my, I'm, I'm lucky because my sister-in-law is a social worker and I, I called her and she had seen another episode where I was home alone and something had happened with one of my kids. And I, I also got triggered. So I reached out to her and I said, Emily, I like, I need like, I need to figure my stuff out. So she said, well, you should talk to a therapist and you should speak to a CBT, a cognitive behavioral therapist. And I was like, mm, yeah, not sure. Cause I'm not like a therapy person. Like my issues aren't that bad. And there, I, there was a stigma. I did not want to talk about going to therapy. That's, that wasn't going to be me. I wasn't going to be the periodontist that needed therapy. Like Mm, no. So, um, so I did, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my family. I didn't tell anybody, but I spoke to this therapist and, and, and my opening line with her, which we're friends now. And so we laugh about it is I said to her, how many sessions is it going to take just to make this whole perfectionist anxiety thing kind of go away? And like seven years later, it's like <laughs> still working on it. You know, it's, it's a journey, right? So um, so um, I had a few chats with her, realized that um, the, I needed something scientific, like I needed something with like fancy words, like sympathetic and parasympathetic. And I don't need that now, but at the time I needed that. I needed a buy-in, like I needed to know I could change my brain. Like this was like a thing for me, like talk to me about the science. Like if I do this work, you know, how am I going to rewire? And, and those things became kind of the sexy things for me to, as a reason why I should pursue it. So that's why I got into MBSR. So I did mindfulness-based stress reduction training with, with the folks that, that were working with John Kabat-Zinn at the time. So Florence Maleo Mayer, Judson Brewer, you know, these are the dudes that I was doing these retreats with. Um, and they were all out of the University of Massachusetts. So I would do these these retreats that were week long. They were meant for therapists who were training. Um, they were meant for people who were sent from their institutions to bring this information back to their, you know, uh, offices and, you know, work environments. Um, a lot of people in medicine, I was always the only one who was a dentist. Like for, for I mean, I'm sure it's changed now, but back in, back in those days, people would be like, you're a dent, oh my God. Yeah, of course, dentists do. Don't you guys have like a high suicide rate? So then it was like, I became known as like the dentist who would go to these things. So in my training is where like, I realized that, you know, there's this thing like that your amygdala can be fired. Like you can walk around with this like massive amygdala fired up and, and your prefrontal cortex is not coming on. And, and that's why you can't regulate and you know, these gorgeous charts with like being in your window or zone of tolerance and what it meant to be outside of that. So being hyperactive or, hy you know, being um, aroused outside of that or hypo and going below and depressive and numb and dissociated. So these things became kind of um, uh, my, my, these people became my teachers, these books and, and the lessons in there became kind of uh, my focus for the next few years. That's all I did. I just observed, I would go to the office, I would realize who, you know, that my system was getting wrapped up. Um, I would get an envelope from our college, you know, with a patient complaint, and it was catastrophe. Like, then I was like, is it really this bad? Like, you know, what part of me, like, I started really dissecting my, my um, a reaction to everything. I wasn't responding to anything in my life. Everything was a fire. Everything was a tiger in the woods. Everything was reactionary. And learning the tools to just downregulate my sympathetic, you know, system and do all those tools like, you know, mindfulness tools and bringing some parasympathetic really helped me to um, on this journey that I'm still on, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just just fascinating, and I and I love that you were the only dentist that yeah. kind mm -hmm. of spearheading the the way for for other dentists, and um, and and thank you again for being honest about therapy. And I think yeah. you know it it we're recording this now, and it's Suicide Prevention Month. Um, so you know I think these things are important again to talk about, and 
Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I'm so annoyed because I'll tell you why this annoys me. Um, British Dental Journal had, um, and I, and I present this, this article in my, in my presentations, um, they had surveyed post pandemic, uh, a thousand dentists, uh, through the NHS system in England and 18% of those dentists that were surveyed had contemplated committing suicide within the past year. And that's a horrific number. That's like 20% of a room of us if we're, you know, a, a whatever people, like a thousand people. And it's, to me, it's, some people say the part that annoys me is really how many dentists actually commit suicide? Like, let's get those numbers. It doesn't matter. If someone on a survey anonymously put down that they had contemplated taking their own life, 18% of those thousand people, thousand dentists surveyed wanted to take their own life. So in, in lines with what you were just saying about suicide prevention, that's a massive number. That's a massive number. And we all know dentists. I mean, I think a lot of people know dentists or dental students who have taken their own life. And it's tragic. It's horrible. It affects so many people. And um, to me, it's really important that 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 when I do these talks, it's the people that are in that 18% are people who really need professional help. They they need to call someone right away. They need an intervention or, or help right away. The people that I'm talking to are the people who are kind of oscillating in that up and down, up and down. Like let's let's get these people um to become aware and so that so that we don't they don't go into that 18%. Mm -hmm. So it's really, the awareness is so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. So if our listeners are, are curious right now, um, maybe you can give a, a couple of good tips that of mindfulness, stress reduction techniques that they could incorporate into their daily life right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important. I mean, you know, I find dentists aren't very receptive to the very basic stuff yeah. of breathing, like breathing, like it's so basic, but it doesn't, it doesn't get them excited. I find what excites the dental community are, are things like when I, when I talk about responding versus reacting to stress. So that seems to be one that makes everybody get their notepads out. Like when I'm talking about the breathing stuff, People assume they know how to breathe and, and we don't, I'm still learning how to breathe. Like, what does it mean to actually ground? Like if I just saying that to you, I just made myself feel really heavy in my chair. So I just was like, okay, let everything go. Let my stomach go. Cause we're always sucking in our stomach and in the dental chairs, actually to, to maintain our posture. Um, that's a very on position. This is like an armed and ready position because we're we're drilling with this tiny thing on a moving target, right? So by by grounding, so a really basic thing of just if, when the patient's chair is going back, just feeling the heaviness of yourself in the chair just makes makes me um makes everything just go down a notch. And I also try to look out my windows. Luckily, I have windows I can look out of. Many people can't. So um loops as great as they are. And I don't work without a loops, loops and a light, but that's, that's, you know, when, when animals get um, in the sympathetic nervous system, the pupils dilate. Well, that's what we're doing all the time. We're, we're literally in a dilated mode at all times. So looking out at a tree, looking out at a cloud, anything peripheral is uh, going to bring on the parasympathetic nervous system. So even if you just put some nice artwork on the wall, something calming, a tree, something natural, like even if it's a just an image of a tree, it's been known, you know, you take a glance, you look out the window. And it's amazing because when your assistant sees you do that, they do that. And when they do that, then we're we're communicating with mirror neurons, which are which are not in our awareness, but we're communicating through mirror neurons, and we're doing this with our partners, our children, our patients, our staff. They will inadvertently also kind of be like, "Oh, no tiger here," but for so many years of my practice, I literally felt like there was a tiger in the room, and so I'm always on, and that goes to our staff too. 
And when you run out of your operatory, you know, you, you're rhyming out numbers and codes and treatment plans and, and this and that. And did you call Dr. So-and-so? And why is that patient late and dramming your schedule? Um, it's going to affect others too. And then you wonder why this, why staff aren't happy or, or, you know, like I take them to these courses, but why don't they practice these things? Uh, because you have to practice it. You have to model it in order for them to buy in because it comes from the top down. If you're not buying into this stuff, you can't expect it's going to come from the bottom up. They may want, they all come to my lectures. So a few dentists do a lot of stuff. Okay. And they come up to me after my dentist doesn't do this stuff. I told my dentist, I told my dentist, you know, and, and I'm just like, yeah. So, you know, keep trying, keep encouraging them. And, and the ideas are basic, those tools. Um, but, you know, the, the, I, the learning the difference between being reactionary and responsive, so critical that if you learn that um, when you uh, are triggered, when you get bad news, when you get a bad Google review and you get that in the office and then you're all triggered and this is the end of the world because some patient left a bad review, that, that needs to, you need to have some tool, whether it's breathing, um, whether it's just noticing it which is always the first step oh look like I feel like this is the end of my career because I just got a letter from my college or a bad review or a complaint and then knowing that okay no 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 there's there, there could be a way that I can just take a few breaths that I can call a trusted colleague that I can reach out to someone that I can just use these tools of grounding and breathing that I might just bring on the whole point of that is to just bring on a little bit of prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. Because it's not that the breathing is going to solve the patient complaint problem, but the breathing and grounding and listening to a podcast on the way home rather than the news, it's just going to bring on the prefrontal cortex because the amygdala has an amazing way to override the prefrontal cortex. So if you're able to do those things, not that those things are the things that are going to solve your issue. No, it requires your intervention. I understand. I know you need to write the letter. I know it makes you anxious, but those tools when used and when used regularly, so you can go to them, just help you bring on another part of your brain that's rational, that has the ability to say, oh, how about I call this person first before I respond to that email? How about I maybe take a day and, and not respond and then respond when I'm in a better place because I'm not sure I'm at my best right now. That's awareness. And that's the ability to just take a, take a pause. And that's, that might be all you need. The next day, it might not seem as bad or might not seem as bad because you confided in somebody and and that person helped you. Um, you know, you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. So if you surround yourself with good people, they're going to be your pillars and they they people that support you, people who are like minded. So as lone wolves, as dentists, we 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 forget that there is a community. And you guys are helping build that community, which is amazing. But this community is important of honest, um, resourced folks who can who can help us see something different, you know? There is so much wisdom in what you're saying and hearing, and it's a really good reminder that as the dentist, we are modeling for our team, for our patient, for everybody else in that room, that if we're down a level then they can be too and that in effect is reminding us that we are the leaders in the practice and how does all of this tie into why and how effective leadership training for dentists help them you know lead their teams build their teams and navigate those challenges that come in every day yeah yeah that's so that's it you hit the nail on the head. It's we are the leaders of the practice mm -hmm. and we are looked at for not just leadership with the schedule and leadership with the, with the, you know, how many starts we had if we're an orthodontist or how many cases we did or how much, how much the hygiene produced. No, we are, we're the leaders to also um, develop the culture of what's tolerated in our office. What isn't, what do we respond or do we react? And, and we set the tone. If we're, 
if we're the leader of the practice and and the tone is you know we run we run this kind of practice these are our our goals we don't have boundaries you know you come into work um you know with no boundaries you've had a crappy day you you're allowed to bring that in the office that's allowed to spread your bad mood is can go unchecked and uncontrolled and affect the people around you um you know if if we don't put things in place to check all of those little bits, then then we're really not uh, practicing the full scope of leadership. And we know how to, um, we all of us know the right things. I think most dentists, they they understand sort of the, the right and wrong. They hear the things that are happening in the office, but it's it's difficult because people don't know how to address these things. So mm-hmm. you know, it might, it might just be like, oh, you know, with the staff fight and gossip, and and I hear this, but it almost it's just it it is what it is because it can't change. And the point is that it can, and with effective leadership, and one can actually govern themselves. And when you govern yourself and you are you're a leader of your own emotions and your own reactions, then you will model that. And, and the people around you will see that, oh, you know, you have boundaries. So um, I love offices that are friendly. I love offices that say they're all friends. But at the end of the day, you you must have a boundary. You know, your issues with your husband or wife or partner cannot spill into the workplace because they are your issues and, and you are running a dental practice. And, and I find where the boundaries start to get porous and where, where things are spilling from us to them and, and therefore from them to us, then we can't do the review of a staff member um, with compassion, but also um, being assertive. We don't have to be aggressive. We just have to have, you know, a, a very, honest discussion with somebody and say, you know, I've noticed that, um, you know, um, we all come in with different moods, but I've noticed that, you know, can we try and do a weather check-in? So before you come in, what's what's the weather in your world right now? Is it dark and stormy? Uh, you know, are you in sunshine? Is life good at home? All is great. Can we just do a check-in? So that even if you are having a bad day, but that there's some awareness that you are and that that might affect the people around you. Does that mean maybe today you do the recalls and you know the the, the go go on the on the third computer at the front or the second computer and you do that and so we'll have someone else patient facing because it's it's not realistic that everybody should show up just perfect to work every day we don't but as a leader awareness and being able to express that you know been a bit of a rough go at, you know, at home for me with, you know, my, my, my daughter going off to school. And um, so guys, I just want to say like, thanks, thanks. Just, just bear with me while I get through, you know, these couple of days and, and, and I'm happy to get feedback. So like, tell me if I, if I was short with anybody, you know, I apologize, but, and, and you have to be um, all the, the hot topic now is, is leadership, you know, compassion and leadership and, and, this, this is such a buzzword because you want to be compassionate to yourself and to others. So when you are a compassionate leader, you, you are leading uh, with emotional intelligence. Because if, if you want to go into work very angry, but expect everybody else to be happy and lift you up because you're so pissy and angry, but they should be so happy, doesn't work. Doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work anywhere. It doesn't work in the dental practice. It doesn't work at home. It it's but it's almost expected. It's almost expected that the dentist can bark, be angry, uh, be moody, and that the people around should just take it and you know and just put on their best smiles. It doesn't make for a nice work environment. So um, leadership training, which is not taught to us, um, is important. And and it's and emotional intelligence is a big part of leadership training. You got to know yourself. What type of leader are you? You know, and what what um, there's about twelve very commonly used different leadership styles in the business world, which, which is where all this information comes from. But the one that is most applicable in dentistry, they abbreviated HCL. It's human centered leadership, and it's the idea of 
um, everything to do with emotional intelligence and maximizing um, knowing yourself and what type of leader you are, who you are, because I might not be an assertive leader. I might not be um, not a dictator in my office. It might not be my way only. But if it is, just express that, you know, the, this is the way I want things done in my practice, you know, but great, you know that about yourself, you can express it, you can, you can, you know, it's not that you're, that you don't say that you just come in, and you're angry with everybody for why they don't do certain things and then get mad. No, you just have to be, you just have to express that this is a kind of a leader you are. It, it's training, you know. I could listen to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> You don't want to. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, really, you just you just open the floodgates to so many questions and so many um, ideas. And and it really just encourages me that there's someone out there like you that has that has walked the walk, um, mm -hmm. been in the dark, come out on on the other side and are still curious, still learning and sharing with other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I know that you love to speak about this to groups, to dentists and groups and teams. And Karen and I have had the honor of being in the audience when you spoke. And it was by hands down one of my favorite mm -hmm. lectures that I've ever attended. Oh, that is so sweet. Thank oh, you. It was so good. So tell us a little bit about, um, you know, how you speak, what, you know, if somebody's interested in bringing you into their group, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. You know, it's, um, uh, I love to speak. Uh, I find that that's the, that's the form in which I find it's it's very comfortable for me. Um, I don't know. I think it's the performance aspect of it. You know, uh, there's a bit of that. There's a bit of the energy that you get off of the audience. And um, so I so I love it. And I love to make it um, fun and engaging and keeping people uh, listening because the it, it can't be very dry or heavy. But I do I do try and lighten it up as much as I can and make it relatable so people understand that I'm still working. I mean, I'm in the, it's so bad because I used to say I'm in the trenches and that's very like warlike, you know, like, you know, it's, 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 it's a phrase, but then I'm, I'm like, I'm very cautious not to use it so loosely, but you know, the idea is that I'm, I'm, I'm working, I'm still practicing. I'm still seeing the patients and I'm still triggered. I still make the wrong decisions. I still have patients in my chair that I'm wondering how this happened. So, um, it's a practice for me too. So sharing it is, is a real joy. Uh, cause I also learn a lot about myself and others. So, um, so I talk to groups, you know, group like um, dental association groups and uh, women's only groups, which are so fun. Like those are, you know, they're so fun. But uh, but I love I love speaking. So, uh, you know, uh, through my various contact methods, um, through my website, you can reach me. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah, we'll make sure and have your websites in our show notes. So. Um, and again, I think both Karen and I would highly recommend if you, if you want a personal referral from either of us, we'll give you glowing stars for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You're so sweet. Thank you yeah. so much. It's such an honor to talk to you guys. You guys are doing such an amazing thing with Mentor and, and, uh, thank you for all the work that you do as well. You're sweet. Thank you. Yeah. So speaking of how to get a hold of you, we have your, um, your websites here, but you have something special on one of your websites, a free emotional intelligence test is on yeah. your leadership in dentistry.com website. And so what, tell us just a little bit about that test. And, and if somebody's curious what they can expect from that. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, I put it up because most people are like, when they leave, they're like, maybe I, and maybe you are emotionally intelligent. You know, how does one know if we're emotionally intelligent or not? It, it's like, it's like this really curious thing. I did my BA in sociology. So, uh, so hence, like I know some things about these studies or these um, standardized questionnaires. So, um, so there are, there are stress questionnaires, stress, you know, am I stressed? How much acute stress do I have? How much chronic stress? So you can, you can find these type of tests. Um, but this is a, this is a free one and I, I had found it. So I put a link on it on 
on the website. And um, I can't remember exactly how many questions. I think it's either 20, 25 questions. It might even be a bit more, but uh, you answer them. And it's, it's almost like one of these agree, strongly agree, disagree, strongly disagree. And in the end, it will tally up um, a score and then it will give you a result. And it will say like on, on a on a gradation, you know, you're not, not going to tell you you're not emotionally intelligent, but it's going to give you sort of a scale on which you can see where you fall, where where highly intelligent would be here and, and sort mm -hmm. of lower. And so it, you know, I, I landed in the middle. Uh, so which is which was surprising because, you know, at some at some point you think you do all this work and maybe you're really highly emotionally intelligent. But then I went and I looked at the questions and some of them are a little trippy. Like I answered it, but it actually ended up working against me. So I still have to work on boundaries so that what came out of it for me is is when I investigated it myself, I was like, oh, I know where it is, because the answer to some of the questions were that, you know, I still don't have the kind of boundaries I have because I think I will come off as aggressive, but I would, it would, I would just be assertive, but in wanting people to like me, I think I kind of don't stick, don't stick to my boundaries. So it, you can learn a lot about yourself with these kind of investigations and it's kind of fun. So it's on the website and, and I didn't make it. It's, it's a, it's a standardized one that's out there. Yeah. Super fun. But, you know, yeah. I, I love that, you know, it's a lifelong journey. It's you, you keep learning, you keep, you know, but the fact that you're curious and you want to improve your emotional intelligence, I think is a is a huge piece of the puzzle. Right. Yeah. And aren't we always changing like life? I, I never expected certain challenges. We were talking about this before we, we recorded was with our children, with our adult children. And never have I been as challenged emotionally as I have been with my adult children, uh, because I have a desire to want to save them from suffering. And and I know I know I've been to enough lectures to know that you grow through suffering and pain. But I somehow want to save my kids from that which is not going to help them in the long run. So uh, that's that's a growth point for me. I never knew that I would have to face that and actually kind of hold back and let my kids go through the pain. And it's it's tough, but we're always changing and every decade, every sort of event in our life is going to challenge us in different ways. So I think it's it's fully a journey. I don't think I don't think it's we're going to reach a point. I don't think I'm going to turn into a Buddha or, you know, I'm not going to hike the Himalayas and find myself somewhere. You know, I, I'm going to find myself, but it's going to not be a good version of myself that's on the hike. So I'd rather <laughs> just find myself where I am here. <laughs> I should be all dirty and crabby and yeah, hungry. No, no. <laughs> Ain't nobody want that Sally around, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, this has been a pleasure. We adore all that you do. And gosh, if I ever needed a periodontist, I'd want to, I'd want to be in your practice. <laughs> oh, so sweet. So sweet. Thank I'd be talking to you the whole time about our emotional intelligence and you'd be like, totally, we would be. We'd get no work done. Brain. We'd get no work done. Your job right. would not be complete. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but Thank you for spending some time with our listeners and um, yeah, we'll make sure your contact information is in the show notes below. So thank uh, you. It's such an honor. Thank you yeah. so much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Listeners know we adore you and we hope you found some encouragement on our podcast today. We'll see you on the next episode. Cheers. Bye. Thanks for listening and subscribe for more holistic performance content.